And uh, we're studying the book of Jeremiah on Wednesday nights, and Lord willing, uh, before the Lord comes, comes back, I'm not real sure. We might get through this book. I don't know. But anyway, I'm enjoying it. And uh, I'll tell you what, that just blessed my heart, the whole song service. And uh, I'm just thankful that we can call on the name of Jesus. And I'll tell you, there's power in that name. I'll tell you what, it's that name that we're saved by. I know there's saving power in his name. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you're going to be saved, it's going to be in the name of Jesus. But I'm glad that even like with uh, Simon Peter, when he was walking on water, and he took his eyes off the Lord, and he began to sink. He couldn't get too many words out when he began to sink. In fact, he was about to drown, and the only thing he could get out of his mouth was, Jesus saved me, basically. That's all he could utter, and I'll tell you, that's all he needed. Amen. God and the person of Christ stretched forth his hand and lifted him up out of that, that tumultuous sea and rescued him. There's times, like I've said in time past, you can't get the brethren together to have a prayer meeting. It's nice to know that you can call on the name of Jesus in any situation, though. Isn't that true? I'm thankful for that. There is power in that name. Jeremiah chapter number 34. Uh, we, we obviously have wrapped up chapter 33, so we're in 34. And so let's stand around to the reading of God's Holy Word. We're going to try to cover seven verses tonight. I'll do a little bit of review so that you'll understand why it looks like we're going backwards in time when we come to chapter 34. Beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and all his army and all the kingdoms of the earth of his dominion and all the people fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities thereof, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. And thou shalt not escape out of his hand, but shall surely be taken and delivered into his hand, and thine eyes shall behold the eyes of the king of Babylon, and he shall speak with thee mouth to mouth, and thou shalt go to Babylon. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of thee, thou shalt not die by the sword, but thou shalt die in peace, and with the burning, burnings of thy fathers, the former kings which were before thee, so shall they burn odors for thee, and they will lament thee, saying, Ah, Lord, for I have pronounced the word, saith the Lord. Then Jeremiah the prophet spake all these words unto Zedekiah, king of Judah, in Jerusalem, when the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left, against Lachish and against uh, Azekah, for these defense cities remained of the cities of Judah. You may be seated. May God Add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. I want to preach tonight on a thought, look over the wall. Look over the wall. And you say, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, stay with me and you'll figure it out. Now, as I, as I kind of said in a, a few moments ago, I, I want you to understand that all of the book of Jeremiah is not laid out chronologically. Everything's not in order and succession of events. And you say, why? Well, because God determines how he wants to give his word to his readers. God determines that. And that's not circular reasoning. There is a reason in all that he does. The arrangement of scripture, like everything that God does, it serves a purpose. And I want you to understand that chapters 2 through 29, as we've studied through them, we found that it predicts the destruction of Judah. And we saw it coming Jeremiah preached for 40 long years that Judah was going to be destroyed, and then God breaks from the chronology of things to give a word of hope, a word of comfort before continuing to describe the actual destruction of Judah, beginning in chapter 34. And so we've got the little insert section, chapters 30 through 33, which, as I noted when we covered those chapters, scholars refer to chapters 30 through 33 as a book within the book. In fact, it's referred to as the book of hope because, if you recall, in those chapters, God gave future hope to Israel. And we fast forwarded to the time where uh, Jeremiah is sitting in prison, and he's given the revelation of what's to come in the latter days. We learned in chapter 31, for example, that God would promise a new covenant to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Thank God for the new covenant, for the New Testament. But this covenant would provide his people with a new heart and cleansing, and it would, it would forever correct 
Israel's backslidings. They would in that day, when they received their Messiah, become the people of God in truth and in sincerity. They would truly be the people of God. In chapter 33, we discovered that the promise promise of God to the nation was that God would eventually give them a righteous king. They'd had no real good success with kings here lately. Uh, David was as good as they had, had, and he wasn't perfect. He was far from perfect, but God promised that through the line of David, they'd receive the righteous branch of David, and that was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he was rejected of his own. He was not received by the nation. One day, though, he will return to sit upon the throne of David. But we saw that God promised the rightful king would come, and God also promised that when the righteous branch of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, returns that Judah shall be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell in safety. That was in the last chapter we looked at. And God said these promises, these covenants that he made with Abraham and to David and the Levites, they are as sure and as fixed as the order of day and night in his creation. As sure as there is a day and night, these covenants are sure. Now, that's wonderful because the new covenant extends to all who believe. Thank God for that. That means that covenant, that covenant we're a part of through the blood of Christ is as sure as God's fixed orders in the, new, in the universe. Now, in chapter 34, where we're picking back up, it looks like we are, after we fast forward in time to speak of Israel's hope, we're going back to where we left off in chapter 29. We're beginning to see the judgment that Jeremiah's been preaching about begin to unfold. Now, before we jump into chapter 34, I want you to think about this chronology, this interruption. Most people don't think much about the chronology of Scripture in order to In other words, they just wanted to try to figure out where we are in history in this particular passage. But I see something beautiful here in God dropping this little section. It kind of fast forwards to the end in the middle of this book. I see something beautiful here. You say, what's that, Brother Mark? I see God's care and concern for us. What do you you mean by that, Brother Mark? Here's what I know. God wired us. God designed us. And God knows that we need hope. And in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of this coming judgment, God sort of pauses everything. He takes us to the ladder and says, hey, there is hope. God wanted us to purposefully, before we continue through this book and see how Judah will be destroyed in judgment, he wants us not to lose sight of the future hope that he has for his people. In fact, that's what he says in chapter 31 in verse 17. He says, and there is hope in thine end. I know things are going to get bad. In fact, they're going to get worse. But I want you to know as you begin to see the days grow darker, there is hope in thine end. I want to say that God is the God of all hope. That's what Paul said in Romans 15. He is the God of all hope. And so if you're his child by way of application, I want you to know that you have a a sure hope in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 6, 19 says he he is that hope. And we have this hope that is the anchor of our soul. We have an anchor for our soul, and that's the hope of Christ, no matter what's going on in the world around us or in our life personally. And we can say with the psalmist, when times of despair or times of of, of fear come our way, we can say like the psalmist in Psalms 42 and verse number 5, why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Disquieted. Dis means not. Quiet means to be, at, to be at peace. Disquieted means to be restless, to be anxious. Why are you anxious? Here's what you need to do. Hope thou in God. Hope thou in God. There is an anchor for our soul in the person of Christ. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help I love, the help of his countenance. I love that picture. Hoping in God is a choice to recognize by faith faith that the Lord's countenance is turned toward his people. His eye is continually upon his people to watch over them to ensure that all things are working together for, our, or for his purpose according to our good in everything, in every aspect of life. Hoping in God is a decision to praise God for the help we know he will supply. When you begin to hope in God, you will begin to praise him for his help, help that you can count on because his countenance is turned towards you. And whenever you do begin to hope in God, that will bring healing and help to your troubled heart. You say, how do you know that? Because the psalmist said so. In verse 5, he said, hope thou in God, 
For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Now watch the little change in verse number 11. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the help of my countenance and my God. He went from saying, in God's countenance, there's help, but in the help of his countenance, I find help for my countenance, amen? <laughs> the help of God's countenance is our hope. And so when you embrace this hope, when you claim the hope that we have in Christ, it becomes help to your countenance. Here's the point. God knows we need hope in the midst of darkness, in the midst of suffering, even when the suffering is, at, is the judgment for our own sins. And so he interrupts the chronology of Jeremiah so that the reader won't lose sight of his hope as the days grow darker. You see, Jeremiah is about to resume his writings about the coming judgment in chapter 34. But the people that were reading this, the people that would be the surviving remnants there in Babylon, they needed to have hope. The judgment was sure because the people had rejected the, the warnings of God, but God graciously inserted chapters 30 through 33 in the middle of the book to confirm his mercy and his faithfulness, his covenant faithfulness, and to give his people hope. So don't, don't just think, well, we just got to figure out the chronology. I want you to see the beauty in that. So let's now get back into the text in verse number 1, and we'll figure out where we are historically. But we're going to back up a little bit. Uh, Jeremiah 30, or 34 and verse number 1 says, The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army and all the kingdoms of the earth of his dominion, and all the people fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities thereof, saying, and I'm going to stop right there because I want to first talk about the circumstances for this message. We're going back in time, as I noted. Chapter 33, Jeremiah was in the last days of Judah, sitting there in prison within the king's palace. We're backing up. Jeremiah's not in prison. This is probably a year before this seed, this final invasion. This is uh, before he was thrown in prison. But this is the moment whenever the prophecies which Jeremiah had been predicting about Judah's fall to Babylon were coming true. Now, Babylon's already come against the nation a couple of times, but this is the final invasion, and everything that Jeremiah's been preaching for 40 years is about to come to fruition. Babylon is marching with all of its strength, and you can see the strength of the Babylonian assault indicated by the repetition of the word all in verse number one. All his army, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar's army, all his army, and all the kingdoms of the earth of his dominion and all the people fought against Jerusalem, against all the cities. This is a national crisis. Nebuchadnezzar had brought his entire army to deal decisively with Judah once and for all. If you've been watching the news with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, you get a kind of a glimpse of what's going on here. One by one, the cities of Judah are falling only Jerusalem at this point and two other fortified cities are still holding out. Look down at verse number 7. When the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left, against Lachish, against Azekah, for these defense cities remained of the cities of Judah. So Jeremiah's not in prison and there's still three cities still holding out, but this is a grim picture. Think about it. All of the other... Judean cities, except three, have already fallen. It's just a matter of time before Lachish and, and Azekah and Jerusalem fall too. This is a bleak situation for Judah. In fact, we find out just a little bit of you know, insight from uh, history of how dire the situation was. It's illustrated in a tragic letter inscribed on some clay potsherds that were discovered in the excavations of Lachish. Lachish's ruins back in 1935. Years ago, people used to say, historians said, there's no such thing as Babylon. Babylon was made up, and then they unearthed over in the area of Iraq some uh, pottery with the name of Nebuchadnezzar or Nebuchadnezzar on it. They found out Nebuchadnezzar was real, and Babylon did exist. And in 1935, they found these potsherds with inscriptions that describe what was going on right when Jeremiah was writing. But this letter that was written upon these potsherds or these clay, these clay pots was a letter written to the commander at Lachish, 
from an outpost outside of Lachish, but it was close enough to Lachish and Azekah to see the signal fires from both cities. They were to be watching to see to figure out where Babylon was. Evidently, Azekah had just fallen because the officer wrote these words, and let him, the commander of Lachish, also know that we are watching for the beacon or the signals of Lachish in accordance with all the indications or the fire signals that my Lord hath given, but we do not see a Zecca. Imagine being that soldier there at that outpost out front of Lachish, and he's been sending signals back and forth with another city that's still holding out, and those signals stop going up. He knows there's another territory that's just fallen. We're next. The 21 Lakish letters written on broken pieces of pottery were found in a room filled with ashes from the fire that Babylon destroyed the city with in 587 B.C. But when this word from the Lord came to Jeremiah, there were just three cities left standing. Judgment had come just as the prophet had said it would 40 for 40 years. Now look at verse number 2. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Let's stop right there and talk about the command in the message. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and God gave Jeremiah a message and told him to deliver it to the king himself. Now, this was a command from the Lord that Jeremiah could either obey boldly and deliver it to King Zedekiah, or he could Choose to obey, or disobey, I should say. And I want to say this is a hard message to deliver. We're going to look at it. It was a hard message to deliver, and I mean, what I mean by that is it wasn't an ear-tickling message. It wasn't a positive message. It wasn't a comforting message. And because this seemed to be the worst possible time to deliver such a message, I know Jeremiah, being a man of like passions, felt the pressure to perhaps tone it down, <laughs> tone down the message, or maybe kind of... Uh, offer it with some soothing words, but I want you to know that Jeremiah will be faithful. Nevertheless, delivering such a message to the king during a time of war could get you thrown into prison or executed if it angered the king. We found out what it actually accomplished, didn't we, in chapter 33, but we'll get to that in a few moments. But as I thought about that and the pressure that Jeremiah had to feel when he was re receiving this message to deliver to the king in a time that was terrible. At, at the time, whenever the nation is at its wit's end, this reminds us that God's word is to be proclaimed and shared to all people, no matter who they are and no matter their response to it. To withhold the message and to be silent with the truth of God is flat-out disobedience because we have been commissioned by the Lord himself to preach his gospel to every creature. Now, let's look at the message specifically and talk about the content of it. Because God told Jeremiah, and when we think about what's going on, while the smoke of these other cities which had been burned to the ground, while that smoke's still smoldering and rising, he tells him at this point to go to Zedekiah because Jerusalem's getting ready to fall next. In verse number 2, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. God tells Jeremiah to deliver a message of conflagration of the city. Now, Jeremiah had already been proclaiming that Babylon would invade from the north and destroy Judah. So this is not a new message that he's delivering. He's been saying for almost 40 years that this nation is going to attack from the north, correct? And that they're going to uh, basically stomp all over Israel or Judah, I should say. Jeremiah's been preaching that judgment was coming for years and, and pleading with the people to repent, including the king. But no one would listen. They scoffed at his message. In fact, they rejected his message. They chose to, to believe the competing message of the false prophets. The false prophets were saying, there's no judgment coming. There's going to be peace and security, peace and safety. No, we're just going to enjoy the blessings of God. There's nothing to worry about. But this time... Jeremiah's preaching at this moment with what was going on in his world would be like a siren or an alarm going off. It was an alert to the king that the enemy is near, that God's judgment is here. Just as you hear those sirens when you watch the news and you see that uh, the 
perhaps the capital city of Ukraine is being attacked, you'll see those sirens are going off when the attack is coming. Let me say, Jeremiah was that siren in Jerusalem. The signs of the time were all around him, and all he Zedekiah had to do was peek over the wall of Jerusalem and see the smoke rising from the cities around him, which had already fallen, and he would have known that what Jeremiah was preaching was true, that God was serious, that God's word was coming to pass. God wanted Zedekiah to know and to understand that his rebellion against Babylon, it would not succeed. His efforts to fortify the gates of Jerusalem were in vain because God had already deter- determined to give Jerusalem into the hand of king, the king of Babylon who would burn it to the ground. Not only that, God also said in verse number 3, And thou shalt not escape out of his hand, but shalt surely be taken and delivered into his hand, and thine eyes shall behold the eyes of the king of Babylon. That should scare you right there. And he shall speak with thee mouth to mouth, and thou shalt go to Babylon. If you know anything about Nebuchadnezzar, you didn't want to stand eyeball to eyeball with him as his enemy. And so what he's talking about is the capture of the king. While King Zedekiah thought that he could perhaps hide behind the city walls of Jerusalem, those great walls, and that he could perhaps uh, be protected by the forces he had amassed or assembled within the walls of Jerusalem. And if all else fails, he had an escape plan. He could escape through one of the underground passages. I mean, there were aqueducts in Jerusalem. I've toured them where you could go in and out through the city and slip in and out and not be seen. He perhaps thought, well, I can get out of here. And God speaks to him and says, no, you're not going to escape out of his hand. You're going to stand eyeball to eyeball with Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to dress you personally. And then he's going to take you as his captive to Babylon. This message from Jeremiah should have put a holy tremble in Zedekiah as the signs of the time were coming to pass, but it didn't. There are none so blind as those who are willfully blind. He just did not want to see what was coming to pass. What Jeremiah had been preaching, he just kept saying, I don't see nothing different. You've been preaching that forever, amen. I don't think this is a specific time or whatever. It's kind of like people today, they're scoffers. You you try to talk to people about what's going on in our world and say, oh, yeah, there's always been wars, rumors of wars. There's always been problems with Russia. There's always been problems with, with terror, and there's always been diseases and things like that. And they are ignoring the things that are coming to pass, and it's just like it was in the days of Noah when they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage. In other words, they're planning for the future. They're planning their lives beyond marriage, and they think the world's going to continue on as it, as it is. And God says they were swept away and knew not when the flood came. That's the way it's going to be when the Lord returns. In verse number four, yet hear the word of the Lord. We're continuing on with this message that was to be delivered to Zedekiah. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of thee, thou shalt not die by the sword. Now, that's the only comfort here in this passage. But thou shalt Die in peace. And with the burnings of thy fathers, the former kings which were before thee, so shall they burn odors for thee. And they will lament thee, saying, Ah, Lord, for I have pronounced the word, saith the Lord. Let me talk finally in this message. There's the, uh, God deals with the character of the king's death, how he's going to die and what's going to transpire. Because of the rebellion of Zedekiah, God would have been just in just executing him when Nebuchadnezzar took him captive, but God promised that he would not die by the sword, but rather he would die in peace. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to die in Jerusalem on his bed, and he's going to have a nice life. That's not what that means. In other words, when he says you're going to die in peace, it means you're going to die of natural causes rather than being slain by Nebuchadnezzar. You see, he would be taken prisoner to Babylon, and he would die in a foreign land. However, he would be given a funeral befitting a king in the land of his captors. That's what God said. And that would be in contrast with Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim didn't receive a good funeral, did he? He was drugged back to the gates of Jerusalem, dropped off, and left out there in the sun to be bleached and leached and devoured by animals. But anyway, he said, you're going to die in peace. In other words, you're going to die of natural causes, though he would die in Babylon. Babylon. 
But the Jews would honor him. Those in captivity, no doubt. The phrase, the burnings of thy fathers. Now, that's not a reference to cremation. They're not going to put him on a big stack of wood and burn him like the pagans. The Jews never practiced cremation. They honored the bodies of the deceased by wrapping them with spices like the Lord Jesus or Lazarus. And they burned incense at the royal funerals. That's what the, refer the referral to these burnings are. You see that later in the verse, so shall they burn odors for thee. That's the burning of incense. That's what they did to honor kings. And so God foretold that this honor would be given to Zedekiah as the people in captivity wept and said, Ah, Lord. And this Lord here is not a reference to him being divine. They didn't worship men. It was referring to him being uh, a king. It speaks of him being uh, majesty or uh, being royalty. Ah, Lord. Now, this just indicates that there will be a national sorrow. And you can understand that. Even if he's not a great leader, there was a national sorrow among the Jewish survivors for their last earthly monarch who had sat on the throne of Judah before the nation collapsed. So God foretold all that. Now in verse number 6, we'll continue on. Then Jeremiah the prophet spake all these words unto Zedekiah, king of Judah in Jerusalem. I want to stop right there. What words did he speak? All these words. Let's talk about the compliance with the message. We already have uh, touched on the fact that this message would be difficult to deliver. It'd be intimidating as well to go to a, a king who has probably got all of his uh, security heads and all of his military leaders. They're trying to figure out what they need to do. And then in walks the most unpatriotic guy in the, in the land and says, you're going to fall and what you're doing is a waste of time. You don't want to hear that, right? <laughs> And yet, that was the message he had to deliver. It's not that he was unpatriotic. He was simply being true to God. And as difficult as this was, during this time of intense war, in addition to the fact you know he's probably, Zedekiah is not going to respond favorably, yet Jeremiah obeyed the Lord. The Bible says this old man of God spoke all these words. Every word that God delivered to him, he spoke all these words unto the king. In other words, he didn't soften the message. He didn't back up from it. He didn't water it down. He didn't compromise it. He didn't add to it, and he didn't take away from it. He preached the word of God. He faithfully delivered the whole message of truth which God had given him. And Jeremiah understood it's far more important and eternally rewarding to stay true to the Lord and seek to please him rather than try to please men or go into a self-preservation mode to protect your own assets and your own welfare and your own interest. He chose to be true to the Lord at his own expense, and he would pay for it. But let me say, all of us who are saved have to make this choice whether we're going to be true to God and true to his word. Or will we cower in fear and go into self-preservation mode by being silent with the truth and compromise it? In closing, I want to say that we need to understand, there's just one application here, there are only two responses to God's word. There's only two responses to God's word. We can either receive it or reject it. Let me touch on what it means to re reject it because that is what Zedekiah ultimately did. He rejected the word of God. In chapter 33, we saw how that Jeremiah was in prison because he delivered this message faithfully and faithfully and faithfully continued to proclaim it. And so Zedekiah got tired of hearing it, and he shut him up in the court of the prison. Chapter 33, verse number 1. He was angered by Jeremiah's preaching, and he chose to believe lies. He chose to believe his own heart. He thought he could out maneuver the word of God or escape the warnings of God. He thought he would be the exception to God's word. He knew what the message was. He repeats it in chapter 33. He knew the word of God, but he thought he could somehow, uh, somehow escape what God was proclaiming was coming to pass. And that's what men do. I read of a uh, comedian from uh, a few decades ago he was known to be a womanizer and an alcoholic, and someone walked in and saw him reading a Bible, and they asked him, they said, what in the world are you doing reading the Bible? And he said, I'm looking for loopholes. Let me say, there are no loopholes in the Word of God. I don't know why sinners think that they're the exception to the rule. I know the Bible says that, but that won't happen to me. 
All right, I won't experience that. That's just kind of a general statement, but it don't apply at all. I want to tell you something. What God has said will come to pass. Every jot, every tittle. If Zedekiah, listen, if Zedekiah had simply lifted his eyes above the wall, he'd have saw the smoke, he'd have saw the evidence, he'd saw the sign of the times that what had been preached for these many years was coming to pass. It didn't matter how old uh, the messenger was, it didn't matter what was going on, what changes were being uh, are taking place in the culture, no matter how modern and sophisticated their weaponry was. Listen, God, what God had said was coming to pass. Numbers 23, verse number 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? What God has said, you better stand on it, you better bank on it, it's going to come to pass. And yet he continued to rebel, Zedekiah did. And he later attempted to flee Jerusalem with his sons. God had told him, You're not going to escape, so to try to escape would be foolish. And let me say, when you reject God's word and you don't heed God's word, it's costly. Zedekiah would not listen to Jeremiah. He has him thrown in prison, and when he sees that Jerusalem is going to fall, him and his sons try to make a run for it, and they try to sneak out of the city, perhaps through one of the aqueducts, but they're eventually caught and brought before Nebuchadnezzar, and You know what history says, and well, we'll see it in the Word of God. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had his sons slain before his own eyes, all the sons, and then Nebuchadnezzar had Zedekiah's eyes put out so that the death of his sons would be the last thing he ever saw. And then he was drug off. Let me say, it is costly. It is costly not just to you, but it is costly to others when you don't take God's word serious, when you ignore it, when you think I'll be the exception to it. I'm here to tell you, you better hear the word of God. You better receive the word of God because it's costly to ignore it and reject it. If he had simply received the Lord's word and humbled himself and repented and cast himself upon the mercy of God, perhaps his sons would have been spared. But he rejected God's word, and he rebelled against it, and he hardened his heart, and thus he and his sons paid a tremendous price. I want to say Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know what? We need to take God serious. We need to treat him like he's God. That's where true wisdom begins. When you begin to treat God like he's God, if he's God, guess what? What he said is going to come to pass, and he's got the power and the ability to pull it off, and he's got the memory not to forget anything, Amen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom. Fools despise the wisdom and the instruction of God. They say, I know the Bible says that, but. Boy, that's the path of foolishness. That's a path of folly and destruction. The only other response to the word of God is to receive it. Like the tender, the good ground that's been plowed up, that receives the seed into the earth, and therefore brings forth Growth from the seed. That's the only way to respond to it profitably and positively. And by the way, that's the only difference between humanity. We're all sinners. What's the difference between humanity is this. Some believe God's word and they receive it as God's word and they respond to it by faith and obedience. These are those who were saved and shall be saved in the day of judgment. Those who don't believe God's word and don't receive God's word and they reject God's word, those are the ones who will not be saved. And by the way, in the last days, we should understand that those who reject the word of God, they're only going to increase. Many are ignoring the signs of the time and they're going to be swept away when the wrath of God is poured out. Now, it's not because God doesn't want to save, it's because people choose not to see what thus saith the Lord. Preachers have been preaching this forever. The Lord's coming back. Yes, and we're that much closer, amen? Let me close with the words of Peter because Peter speaks to this, to this end. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 1, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust. In other words, they're, they, they're serving their own purpose and their own agendas. 
and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. They are willingly ignorant. It's not because God's left us in the dark. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. In other words, listen, God destroyed the world one time with water. That has been a lasting reminder. Why do you think that there are some people that want to attack that and rewrite history? Because they don't want that, that testament of God's judgment upon this world to serve as an ongoing reminder. The, the, the God of this world wants us to be blinded. He wants us to believe in an ice age and everything else. When that is a testament, listen, the flood is a testament that God is going to judge this world. And as sure as that happened one time, it will happen again. It won't be with water, God promised not to do that again, but he will destroy this world by fire. In verse number six, let me read that again. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, what about presently? By the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But listen, there is coming a day. God has an appointed time when he says, that's it. Just as with the ark, listen, Noah preached that 120 years that there was going to be a flood, and people said, there's not going to be a flood. We've never seen anything like that. That's just too supernatural. That's too spectacular. We haven't seen water fall from the sky and things like that happen. Oh, that's crazy. You're an old fogey. And only Noah and his family got in a boat. And Noah preached and preached and preached faithfully for 120 years. But finally, there came a day when God said, get in the boat, Noah. And Noah went in the boat, and God shut the door. God shut the door of grace and opportunity, and the flood came. And the same thing's going to happen because that's a picture of what's to come. You say, well, we don't have an ark today. Yes, we do. It's Jesus Christ. Uh, the ark in the Old Testament was a picture of Christ. Yes. All that was an imagery of Christ. I'm thankful I'm in Christ. I don't have to worry about the judgment to come. Why? Because there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. In verse number 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved in the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. In other words, God's not impatient. We don't got to worry about the clock. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why is God not come? Because he wants people to be saved. But he has appointed a day. Don't lose sight of that. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, you say, well, how should this impact me as a believer? He tells us, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, if God's going to judge this world, what manner of persons ought, we, ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to this promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Beloved, I, I, I'll tell you tonight, we need to peek over the wall of our immediate life, look at what's going on around us in our world, and rest assured that the promises of God are true. If you're doing that, then it should have an effect on your behavior and your attitudes. It should produce a holy life and godly attitudes, and at the same time, cause your hope to rise as we look for new heavens and new earth. Amen. And all that's made possible with the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And this same Jesus who ascended, he's coming back. He's coming back. Lift your head above the wall. The signs of the time are all around us. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. As pianist comes to the piano, picks out a closing invitation. If you're here tonight,